play as three acts this evening. You'll have two intermissions. I'd like to welcome you all this evening. On behalf of myself and the cast, it's our honor to be here with you this evening. It's our joy to share this wonderful play with you. Uh, I just would like to give you a little bit of the history of the play. About 12 years ago, we started the play with a staged reading out here in this amphitheater. And that was about as far as it went. And uh, about five years ago, we picked it up again. And we started to perform it as a full-length staged play. And for those of you who are at Swami's class this morning, you would have heard what he said when he started to talk about um, the fact that he often doesn't know why Divine Mother writes through him or what, what she's saying at the time when she does work through him. And I think many of us as artists will feel the same way. I myself, 12 years ago, was in the Peace Treaty. Uh, I sat up here and played one of the roles. And I remember Swami talking about uh, us performing this with uh, professional actors and how we might draw in a professional group. And I thought to myself, we could do that here. And now I look back, and I think <laughs> it's a little bit of foreshadowing, and it was quite a, uh, a thought that Divine Mother had actually started putting in my head at that time. About five years ago, when I started to direct this, I remember saying to Swamiji, I think that the Peace Treaty is a little ahead of its time. And he said, no, it's not ahead of its time at all. And then a few years ago, uh, when we performed the Peace Treaty, it was on the weekend that September 11th happened. And now we uh, perform it again on the heels of a war with Iraq. So with all that in mind, I think you all know the rest of the story, and I need not say more. I think that in the future we'll see the reason for the peace treaty and for other works like it. Swami has written an introduction for the play, and I'll read it to you now. There exists somewhere, perhaps in the middle of the great Atlantic Ocean, a fairly large island. It lies far away from any continent, and few know of its existence. It may even exist in another dimension or in some alternate universe. Crystal Island, this little known place is called. It is a haven of peace and beauty. In certain respects, it resembles lands that we all know but in others, it is unlike any place on earth. For though its residents are like you and me, just people, that is to say, they distinguish themselves from one another in ways that the countries of earth only pretend to do. They exaggerate national characteristics that in the world we know are seldom clearly defined, which is why our boasting of Yankee ingenuity and German genius is so clearly a pretense. And many of them take excessive pride in the outer garbs they wear. There are five clans on Crystal Island. Each is noted for some special talent, as are many nations of our world. Each clan wears a special color, too, as we ourselves wear different colored skins. The colors also emphasize the concept clannishness. There is Clan Emerald, which specializes in dance. Clan Emerald's members dress in green. They try, not always with success, to be graceful in their movements, to dance, some of them only sort of, and to express in movement the characteristics that humanity everywhere possesses, from gaiety to flowing beauty, from pomposity to arrogance. For you see, despite their limited interests, these are all just people like you and me. There is Clan Topaz. Topaz specializes in song, and its members dress, as their name suggests, in yellow. Topaz members concentrate all the variety of human beings in vocal expression. Some of them do it well, others, well, not so well. They are simply people, after all. There is Clan Azure, which specializes in poetry. Azure dresses in blue. The members of Clan Azure try their best, it's a cultural thing with them, to speak poetically. Then there's Clan Ruby, which specializes in merriment and dresses in red. These rubies enjoy humor, tell jokes, and laugh a lot. 
Of course, human nature being what it is, there are many kinds of humor depending on a person's nature, from kindly laughter to jeering mockery and cutting sarcasm. Finally, there is Clan Amethyst, whose members' predilection is for philosophy. They wear the color purple. Their philosophizing displays again the wide variety of human nature from a deep desire to know truth to mere guile, from clever rationalizations to the clumsiest self-justification. As you can see, no clan is perfect in itself. In fact, you and I know that these qualities need to be combined for human perfection to be attained, and the colors intertwined for appreciation of humanity's full potential. But the clans have yet to learn this lesson. Many of their members pride themselves, as those in the world we know do, on their own characteristics. Each clan, of course, tends to view itself as the best clan of all. This play brings correction to that narrowness of vision in the way that fate itself often brings lessons to us all. The action takes place at the end of a long war. Some time ago, Clan Azure invaded Clan Topaz. The other three clans, recognizing the invasion as a threat to their own safety too, joined Clan Topaz against the invader. At last, the allies were victorious. Clan Azure was defeated. The plot of our play concerns a proposal made after the hostilities to establish a lasting peace. The proposal takes the form of a peace treaty. Isn't that how so many nations try to settle these matters? Alas, pride, vengefulness, selfishness, and all the dreary catalog of human failings intervene to prevent genuine acceptance of this noble proposal. At last, another solution is found, one that all of us might do well to seek for ourselves in our own lives. them out of ambush. Charge at them down the slope. Jump from a rock onto an unsuspecting back. Thrust, Perry! Thrust, Perry! Leap aside lightly when an azure devil darted in for the kill. And then, ha! Catch him off guard! And, ha! Ha! <coughs> ha! Robin! <laughs> Did you see me in battle, Robin? Was anyone so brave, so agile, so cunning? I was everywhere! Thrust, Perry! Thrust, Perry! Oh, what glory! What heroism! What a fantastic thing is war! I thought I saw you at the height of battle, resting on a rock. Resting? I was crouched, ready to leap onto an azure's back. But, Fulton, the action had moved elsewhere. Ha! But I was ready for it, in case it returned. <laughs> the wise warrior, as opposed to the mere soldier, anticipates action, awaits the enemy's next move, then it's thrust, Perry, thrust, Perry, slash here, slash there. When I saw you, I had the distinct impression that you were lying down. You saw that, did you? <laughs> ha! But mark my cunning. No one could have seen me from below. Nor could you have seen anyone below. I'd have leapt onto his back undetected, flashed an arm about the villain's neck, struck deep with a dagger, and forced him down, down, till he lay flat on his back. Clan Azure would soon have wept the loss of yet another of their 
Mighty warriors. If you were <laughs> leaping onto his back, wouldn't he have fallen forward to his knees and then his chest? Oh, a quibble! Yes, but this quibble makes me wonder how conscious you were at planning your strategy. The whole thing has a certain subconscious miasma to it. <laughs> Tut, Robin, we have a victory to celebrate. And what a thrilling victory it was! You must have noticed, at different points of the struggle, Clan Emerald was always at the forefront. Uh, the question is, the <laughs> forefront of what? Uh, what? But never mind. We won. All of us together. United in battle. United in victory. Oh, trees, be my witness. This great achievement will be recorded in song for all posterity to hear. Troubadours will praise us to our grandchildren, to their children's children, and on and on for countless generations. Oh, trees, 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 mighty though you be. Yet might you still are might in this great mighty war. Oh, trees, trees, trees. I begin to understand now why the enemy fled. <laughs> to me, it has always seemed a tragedy of vast dimensions that we alone, Clan Topaz, have developed to perfection the lofty art of music and song. Oh, trees, trees, trees! My God, if this be perfection, the tragedy is vaster than even you imagine. <laughs> How easy it is for dilettantes to criticize. What do you know of music? All you people of clan members ever do is dance. Oh, yes, and what dancing, too. When I arrived, I got an eyeful of you, old friend, Mark the Old, lumbering about this flower glen like a hippopotamus. Lumbering? Hippop... You... You wouldn't recognize a dance if it were choreographed with an orchestra behind it. Why, you'd mistake an arabesque for a bad case of lumbago. I'll tell you this much. Clan Azure's troops didn't mistake me for a mere warrior. As I leapt among them tirelessly, all day it was thrust parry, thrust parry, slash here, slash there. Oh, trees, trees, trees. I think it was the very harmony we struck with our topaz battle cry that terrified the azures, sending them fleeing like a herd of buffalo before the lion. Oh, trees, trees, trees. Thrust parry, thrust parry, thrust you parry slash here, my slash still there. Lands. We've been looking for you everywhere. Oh. Joy to you, Mary. Ponder. Well met, friends. I've just been seeing a pen of victory. Is that what all that noise is about? We thought maybe you were shouting for help. <laughs> I got to you for my pains. <laughs> Some help you would have been. Mary, your jokes have a way of setting me laughing till I feel quite <laughs> helpless. Well, we heard you bellowing something or other about trees. I thought maybe you lost your way among them. Lost in the <laughs> forest. Lost in the woods of life. Ponder, is nothing, <laughs> is nothing safe from your philosophizing? You people of Clan Ruby would benefit from a little more philosophy. And you people from Clan Amethyst would benefit from a little touch of merriment. My reference to the woods of life was an illusion merely Yes, to... yes, with you people it's illusions from dawn until midnight. An illusion to life's uncertainties. Wasn't yesterday's victory too in some part an accident? Never! It was by our might that we conquered. Thrust petty, thrust petty, slash here, slash there. Does it even deserve to be called a victory? Yeah. Winning ought to imply gain. What sort of gain is it merely to eliminate one's foe? Ponder, you people from Clan Amethyst are so weighty. Put one of you on a ship and the captain wouldn't dare take on more cargo. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. There is a time to laugh. But there is a time to ponder deeply. And today, my friends, <laughs> is a day for laughter. Yes. Merriment. Yes. At last we can laugh again. Yes. Rejoice again. Yes. Make jokes again. Yes. And our hearts can turn to other things like, well, love. Love? <laughs> love, did you say? Is, is this Mary speaking? Oh, what? What? Can a person be merry and still fall in love? Well, I suppose so, or Clan Ruby wouldn't have survived. <laughs> But it's that tone in your voice, that note of reverence, 
I'd expect you, if ever you fell in love, to court the girl by asking her what the firefly said when his tail was cut off. <laughs> what did it say? Delighted, no end. Uh. <laughs> anyway, it's suitable for you to heave love's heavy sighs as well as... as for Robin to sing solos in a church to an organ accompaniment. You haven't seen the girl. She probably hasn't seen you either. <laughs> My friend, cling to that advantage. Uh. <laughs> I can just imagine it now. Her wandering down a country lane, brooding <laughs> on how to even things with her kid brother for some trick he played on her. And there you are, gazing up from behind the bush, all starry-eyed. And then, in an odd whisper, you guess, <gasps> what a god. <laughs> That's the way with you life of the party types. When you act serious, the wax melts. You become maudlin. Come on, Mary, tell us. Who is she? Who's the girl? Her name is Crystal. Oh, not the girl of my clan. Not Sardok's daughter. You know her? Yes, that's the one. But what's wrong? I know for a fact she's not married. Oh, she might as well be for all the freedom Sardok gives her. He opposes marriage, even within our own clan amethyst. In fact, he opposes friendly cooperation of any kind, unless it's to his own advantage. Philosophical rumination has soured him on the human race. It causes him to cast aspersions on the noblest motives. That's the trouble with philosophers. When they aren't making illusions, they're blithely casting aspersions. <laughs> They'd analyze the fun out of a country dance, and the heart out of a love song, and the laughter out of a joke. But Crystal's not like that at all. Sardok's a sour apple, but Crystal is as sweet as a peach. I've seen her smile. I've heard her laugh. The very flow of her thoughts seems to carry her as if flo floating on a mountain brook towards gay pastures. What? Does she graze? <laughs> <laughs> gay meadows, I should have said. We all get caught, Mary, at our weakest point. You want her to be gay. But mark my words, it won't be long before this gaiety of hers, product of your own fevered imagination, or I'm a buffalo, will be dragged down in your sunny disposition with it to the pits of philosophic gloom. Mm. Sardock today, I tell you, is your crystal tomorrow. Mm. Never. Robin, ball time. Philosophy isn't the gloomy thing you seem to think it. It's a way of facing gloom and overcoming it. I know a better way. Sing. Dance. Laugh. No, meet it head on. See it for what it is. A mere bubble. And it will burst and disappear. Well, but friends, let's not permit our clan's strengths to divide us. Let's join hands and find a way to help Mary out of his woods of diffident courtship. You see, Mary, it is you who are lost. Oh, trees, trees, trees! Speaking of that, look who's coming through the trees right now! Lord Christar! Just look at that crowd! What enthusiasm! Keen 
Rushing through ruins of once cherished homes And shriek with mocking glee Where all around lay desolation Too long have our women trembled in darkened rooms Afraid of every sound Lest some stern, heavy, and booted footstep Halt by their front door And the knock that followed be the enemies Afraid even more achingly of what doleful news the slowly marching weeks might bring. Too long have the ambitions of our youths been warped to dark and violent ends. Too long has creativity been praised there where its art most thoroughly destroys. Friends, from today, let us create peace. Yes. Yes. Peace. Yes. Peace. Oh, my Lord. May we hear how you so bravely, with unprecedented daring and imagination, brought Lord Stolar's boastful host, so vastly more developed than our own, to such total ruin. The credit belongs to all our clans. Even the small part that I played was not really mine at all, for the battle plan was revealed to me. As if by some subtle influence, here in Crystal Glen I sat, heart clouded with despair. My hopes were like a tattered shroud upon the corpse of our former expectations. Defeated in spirit, though not yet in fact, and finding no way to inject fresh life into our desperate cause, I offered my thoughts up to inner silence. For a time I waited. Then... All at once, I understood what I must do. I saw as clearly as if the battle stormed about me. Swords clashed and soldiers struck and died. A ruse by which our lesser strength would win the war against Clan Azure's hordes. What does he do? In the final days before our last desperate stand, we found ourselves backed against the mountains, remorselessly driven from field to blackened field, from tree to blighted, broken tree. Surrender, counting arrogantly, the heart-wrenching hours stalked us throughout our sorrowful retreat. That last day, our enemies, weighty from toasting their all but certain victory, rushed into the fray, undisciplined, pell-mell, intent on making one bold final thrust. Reason might have warned them to step carefully. <laughs> For how true it is that thought is mightier than brute force, and inspiration more perceptive than plans conceived under the influence of habit. So have our great bard son. Oh. That thought alone is wise, saying one which is allied, not to dry reason, but to the inspiration of song and music. A good husband. Leave for now these ancient bards. What Lord Christar is telling us today will be as you too remarked, tomorrow's history. Yes. Let me first set the battle scene. Next, you can relate the part that Clan Ruby played in our historic victory. We played indeed, sir, and Clan Azure was fair game. But the hard work didn't come till later. <laughs> You'll let me tell our part too, won't you, sir? Bolton, how could I forget you? You shall speak later, and you both too, Robin, ponder. I am glad to see the four of you staunchly together still. All safe, sir. They had me to fight for them. <laughs> death penny, death penny, <laughs> slash here, slash there. I'm sure you held your own, Bolton. But let's begin at the beginning. It was sunrise. In the lowlands, where clan as your camp. Long shadows hung draped like inky cobwebs upon the trees and bushes. On the upper slopes, the sun was shining brightly. Farther down, however, shadows blanketed the earth, even where Clan Ruby huddled in pretended fear. <laughs> At the first bugle call, the Azures charged with a great shout rushing up the hill. Mary, tell us all that happened there. Oh, what a brilliant victory. At first, making them think would stand and fight, we hacked fearfully at them with uncertain blades. Thrust petty, thrust petty, slash here. Yes, yes, Bolton and Mary then. All at once, the signal sounded for us to turn and flee up the hill. 
Our flight, well practiced in advance, seemed to the Azures like a fear frenzied rout. Uh -huh. At times we pretended to stumble, oh. though in fact we knew the ground so well that every bush and pebble were a friend. Oh. <laughs> While Clan Azure labored heavily uphill behind us, waited for battle, we'd come dressed for running. Our shields, too, were made of lighter steel, each one burnished carefully in the long twilight hours the day before. Suddenly, emerging into the morning brilliance, we turned and faced them as one man and flashed the reflected sunlight blazing upon our polished shields down into the Azure's blinded eyes. They, panting upward through the shadow brush, were completely unprepared for our resistance. <laughs> Even as Clan Ruby's troops. <laughs> <laughs> Even as Clan Ruby's troops came fleeing up the hill, we, Clan Emerald, opened cunningly the sluice gates, which contained the waters of that little lake up above. Water poured out not enough to flood the slopes, but sufficient to flow over it through channels that had been dug carefully the previous day. <laughs> Downward the water went, bounding and gurgling, so that the earth grew slippery. <laughs> oh, how Clan Azure, their eyes already dazzled, slipped and stumbled as they continued to advance. Just then, Clan Topaz, held in reserve to the left and to the right, rushed out onto the slippery slope. That morning, we'd bound our boots with rough bark, carefully to keep our footsteps sure. The Azure, then, with a great, terrifying cry, a wonderful harmony, <laughs> we burst into the fray, like a storm howling through a mountain pass. The Azures, confused by these unexpected events, were completely unable to stand their ground. Madly, they plunged downhill, great numbers falling during the rout, many breaking limbs, many tripping over fallen comrades and hurtling headlong, arms and legs seeming the spokes of a turning wheel down the rocky incline. Many, too, fell over precipices to certain death. Oh. <laughs> Clan Emeralds next, bark shot like the others, rushed down around Clan Ruby shields and set upon the Azures from behind. Faster and faster we drove them. Soon the fear that impelled our enemies turned into a stark panic. Oh. Terror-stricken, they stumbled down the slopes in disarray like a bubbling water spill. Dispatching life from their bodies was for us as easy as scything fields of wheat. <laughs> Once a force gains momentum, it continues all but irresistibly. We had them running. Now certain victory was ours. Yes. <laughs> the Azures had reached the plains. There in shrunken ranks, they made a final desperate stand. Huh. Clan Amethyst, held in reserve in the woods, emerged at this point from either side of the broad open meadow, fresh for battle. Yes. Thus we burst upon them. <laughs> then it was <laughs> slash here, slash there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Moments later, the Azures, abandoning hope, like wild beasts thrown into a panic from a forest fire, fled frenziedly in all directions. Clan Ruby soon joined the fray. By now, the enemy were so dispersed that none of them could find the means to surrender on behalf of their whole army. <laughs> Our clans fought bravely, all of them. Yes. 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 <laughs> Only at the day's end, with the capture of Stolar, their ambitious lord, did the melee dwindle before it even ceased. Our allied clans, outraged at the moral stench of his foul crimes, cried out, let the monster pay in blood for the suffering he has so callously inflicted yes. that that very sight, his evil head was stricken from its sin loaded body. And then his soldiers knelt, laid down their arms, and trembling, pleaded for mercy on themselves and on their vanquished clan. Whoa, the the down with the Azure devils! Let us not cry for vengeance. No. Stolar's dead, but was it his people who incited him to conquest? No. His was the sin, his and that posturing pack that yeah. fawned on him like jackals, eager for whatever yeah. carcass he might fling their way. Good friends, now that this war's been won, let us turn our energies not to vengeance, 
but to bringing a lasting peace yes. to our yes. Yes. poor peace. battered crystal yes. island. Peace. Oh, my lord, should not Clan Azure pay dearly for the great wrongs they've perpetrated on us? Yeah. yeah. Vengeance alone might be a pointless waste, but as many bards in our clan's long, glorious past <coughs> counsel do punishment as protection against the threat of future harm. Venom, you're caught! Thought you could escape us, did you? <laughs> Spy! Intruder! <laughs> My lord, we meant to kill this azure, this savage beast, the moment we caught him. But finding you here, we, needless to say, sir, now pass our vengeance over to your judgment. Shall we edify these good people here by striking off his head right now? <laughs> <laughs> or is it your exalted wish that the opportunity be taken in greater privacy? My mother, rest her to say of opportunity that it's like dessert. You better grab it quick before someone else gets their muckers on it. <laughs> <laughs> to quote another's mother in such a cause might seem a blasphemy. Your mother, however, seems qualified to pass as an exception. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Was it to preserve the peace of such homes as yours that this war was fought? I, uh, yeah. please. Release that man. But why, oh, sir? What, 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 certainly, you, sir. If you but wish it, sir. Sir, he is our enemy. Our yeah. enemies were beaten yesterday on the field of battle. Their hopes of conquest and their festering dreams of grandeur died with their defeat. What are they now but people simply like you and me? We have no enemies. But my lord, this man is guilty of yes. boldly trespassing on our yes. territory. Yes. Who knows what evil he may have been plotting? Revenge, perhaps, against your sacred person. Oh, yes. He may imagine that his azure cause is not so completely destroyed as you, sir, and we too, I might add, mm -hmm. believe. Such a thing did happen once centuries ago. What if our ancient bard Forgive say? Forgive me, friend, if I interrupt you. It isn't hatred that I behold in this man's searching gaze. Some other thought steeled him to the courage that it required to brave the roving bands of soldiers who today go shouting through these woods, drunk with the wine of victory. Boy, come closer. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I've offered you mercy. Will you give these people cause later to say that hard justice would have been the better course? My lord, I ask no mercy from your hands. <laughs> mercy is sought by weaklings and cowards, <laughs> and by those whose lives are forfeit for their crimes. <laughs> I am no weakling, <laughs> nor am I afraid. Yeah. My life is not forfeit for any wrong I've done. <laughs> I fought for Stolar because he made me do so. But his cause was not my cause, nor were his crimes my own. My heart and mind are pure in the cause of truth, and truth shall live on, even though my body die. In that truth, my lord, not in this frail form, have I my immortality. Bravely spoken. And will all of you say that this young man must die merely because the tunic that he wears is blue? Yesterday, on the battlefield, as Stolar's body lay, stretched out before us like the shadows of late afternoon that spread, lengthened on the cool earth, I thought, Hated he was, mm -hmm. truly, and with cause. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yet now that his ruthless schemes have disintegrated in death's indifference, and tyrannical ambition has been quenched like straw fire in a driving rain, yes. what is left before me but simply the finished story of a man? Already his deeds are only memories. If they live on, it will be to the extent that we ourselves give them nourishment and with the nourishing, risk contamination. For bad memories, like a pestilence, infect the mind that harbors them. Stolar must answer for his sins to a tribunal higher than our own. Yes. Meanwhile, what of us? Shall we live on in hatred? And if so, will not his spirit have vanquished us after all? Our duty is to ourselves, to the peace of our own conscience. Let us forgive. 
Young man, go with my pardon and with that of our united clans. You are free. Oh. My lord, I wonder to find in you such kindness. Nobility of spirit is more to be praised than the mitre dignity of priests. Had my people but known with whom it was we fought, I'm certain they'd have risen against Stolar in a tidal wave of fury that would have overwhelmed him and his hated minions. Starlon! Oh, Oriel! Oh, oh Starlon! Thank God I've come in time! Oh, my Lord! Lord Christer! Save him! He's not guilty! Starlon's as innocent as a crystal stream. Nothing he's done could deserve punishment! <laughs> Oh, Starlon, Starlon, when I'd heard you come, foolish boy, you might have waited until times were calm. But when I'd heard you'd come and were discovered and had to, had to flee, oh, my beloved, I never believed you'd be killed. For again and again, I'd offered my own life and forfeit for your own. Star, Lord Christor, calmly I say it. If this man must die, then tear instead the life out of this, my then useless body. For my life is the same as that which bound so bravely through Starlon's far worthier form. Peace, daughter. Calm yourself. Who speaks of death? I just promised him his life. <laughs> Let not the gusts of passion blind you to the chances of a new reality. Starlon. I learn his name only now from you. Is free to return to his native land. He must, however, leave at once. For there seems to be, as if pent up in the sky above, a lightning charge, trembling with the urge to hurl new blazing bolts of violence down upon the cowering earth. Go, my son, once more I say it, you are free. Sir, I am moved by your generosity. Oriel, my love. My visit here hasn't been in vain. <laughs> Sir, we meet now for the first time since before the war. Ah, the joy of seeing once again your lovely smile. <clears throat> Sir, your nobility has restored my faith in the future of Crystal Island. Dearest, how could I rest without seeing you again as soon as possible? Every day in battle was for me a dream from which I hoped at any moment to awake, to behold you, to hear your voice, to tell you, dearest, a thousand, thousand times, I am yours forever. Oh, what shocking news is this? Now that you are only daughter, born of an aristocratic line, to do with this? Common soldier, yeah. Yeah. this enemy, yeah. this furtive runaway, yeah. Yeah. this fugitive. Yeah. Yes. Young man, tell me, what sort of parents have you? I have no parents. My father and mother, forever adored by me, were slain by Stolar's minions. Oh. There you have it, Oriel. And Orphan. <laughs> this, this wretch's life has been pardoned. But never, I swear to you, will I or your proud father pardon him this insolent presumption, this bold claim to your affections. My daughter, you have a duty oh, oh. not only to your people, but to your rightful class. You, like all of us, must uphold the values which tradition carved patiently over centuries, as in rock, as hallowed. As Dalmian, our ancient bars, proclaim, that man alone is fit for high position, who accepts it with calm and unaffected ease, who breathes no sigh of envy for those above him, nor courts close friendship with anyone below who accepts his state as naturally as all of us accept their present age and life. Oh, the bondage of a stagnant past. <laughs> Isn't principle more important than position? Yes. yes. Isn't fresh insight more vital than tired habit? Yes. yes. We're men and women, made of flesh and blood. Corn. Not wooden chessmen merely, standing stiffly on a checkered board. Are y'all? No. I'll speak. Ooh. It is divinely right. <laughs> It is divinely right that we live our lives as we ourselves believe most deeply, never as others would serenely move us, left, right, diagonally, up, down, 
Shall we accept their bad judgments for us as our fate? No. Their wisdom, not our own, as our good fortune. And their defeat or victory on our behalf as our finalities. Dalian also wrote of obedience. It is a virtue, he said, that... Forgive me. Dear father, dearest mother, you know I love you both. My true desire is to obey you. But what is obedience if living by it one merely dulls one's faculties? Obedience surely is a virtue when seen as an apprenticeship in wisdom. My obedience to you now that I've grown to womanhood is to the truth that I perceive in you. But never forgive me to the heir. The oh, heir? Oh, Daughter, do you friends, dare? Dear friends, now is not the time, nor is it the place for controversy. Wars clash and agony have ended. Shall we the very next day make war again? No. Let the passions no. of our recent past burn low. When peace reigns supreme again over this our island home and over our war-ravaged hearts, then let us each in calmness <laughs> decide on the best course to follow in our lives. Meanwhile, Mary and all you faithful four, Robin, Balton, Ponder, guide Starlon safely through these woods. Take him beyond the dangers that our country holds for soldiers of his clan. Pretend for the sake of caution to hold him sternly in your power, lest any roaming band of soldiers challenge your right to treat him mercifully. Fear not, my lord. We'll hold him with such glowering menace that if any bands pass by, they'll hurry on with whispered sighs of gratitude that we were so fully occupied that we couldn't concentrate our villainy on them. And <laughs> should they attack, it will be thrust. Petty, thrust, petty. Slash there, slash there. Dalton. The men we're talking about are soldiers of our own army. <laughs> <laughs> Down with boastful bullies everywhere! <laughs> Go then, set him safely on the path. Three, three, three! Slash here, slash there! You miss your calling. You both should have been woodsmen. <laughs> See how our thoughts, brooding on war, have overlooked our own humanity? Life is still precious. Love has survived, though hatred did its best to smother it. Lies have not silenced truth, nor have contemptible dishonor and betrayal discredited high principles. Friends, do me the kindness now of leaving me. I have a need to meditate on peace, even as until today I studied war. I wonder if, at this spot, what I am seeking will be given me, a plan for lasting peace. The problem has always been that our clans, except when united by our fear of Stolar, held themselves aloof from one another. Their special talents gave rise to arrogance and competition. All too seldom have nature's gift to them fostered cooperation. But surely now it is time for a change. Stolar's aggression may be seen as but a plow that prepared the soil. If we plant well now, a new crop may flourish, one of shared understanding. As certain plants grow well together, so may this understanding inspire our clans to work together, each learning from the other, each gaining by what he gives. Is this a suitable occasion for our commander-in-chief to be alone? The woods echo with shouts of victory. No one roams these forest lanes tonight, but would be greatly honored to share his celebration with Lord Kristoff. Good hermit, the honor is mine, truly, that you would leave your hut, your prayers, and your solitude to meet me here. The hour is momentous for Crystal Island. The potential for creative peace was never greater than it is today. Like you, I've been meditating on the road ahead of us. I see it forked to left and right. The left an easy path winds carelessly through barren brush and sand, the aimlessness of ancient habit. The right hand fork is for creative men and women, those blessed with that expansive vision 
which lifts the mind above its birth endowments, impelling it to broaden its natural self-interest to include the good of all. This right-hand fork seems difficult at first. After a little plodding effort, however, it passes through verdant fields, orchards, their sweet smell heavy on the breeze, past rose-clustered gardens and happy homes. These good things, which all men rightly crave, cannot be found aimlessly, nor achieved by any who stand resistant to new realities. Life's blessings must be found by dedication, cooperation, and clear vision. This, Father, is the peace I dream of, a fertile peace from which the seeds of future conflict have been purged by kindness and fellow feeling. Victory, Lord Christard has given you a glowing opportunity. Selfish habits of the past accumulated like filth through long neglect. Today lie scattered abroad by the winds of violence and destruction. This is a season when seeds of new ideas have a chance of sprouting and taking root. Airmen's thoughts return again <laughs> like bears in wintertime to their accustomed caves. It thrills me to hear you so voice my inner thoughts. Have you suggestions, Father, for how we might proceed? The present need is that your guidance be born of inner vision. Human thoughts drift all too easily from one ill-founded concept to another. The present need is that we build with wisdom. Let the foundation for your insights, Christoph, be the bedrock of inner clarity. This is the second time I've come here to pray. Only days ago I sat here, lost in despair. Then all at once, with utter certainty, I knew what I must do to pull from the furnace of self-doubt the sword, strengthened and purified of victory. I felt that a higher presence listened to my prayers, and because my thoughts were not for myself, but for the good of all, answered me. I'm not surprised. Often in Crystal Glen, I've prayed and meditated. God's blessing lingers in the very ground, even as sunlight's warmth lingers in a rock long after darkness has cooled the changeable and faithful air. Had your thoughts as you sat here continued in despair, your curtained mind would have barred passage to inspiration's light. But your prayer was for understanding by asking in this manner, you opened yourself to the subtle influences that are here in Crystal Glen. Such I felt was the case. Therefore, I am here now. And therefore, I left my hermit cell to urge you, Lord Christar, open yourself once again to the whispers of higher guidance. Find in silence the truths that you so generously seek for others. to find you here. My child, have you too come here to pray? Oh, I often come here. Though my way of praying may well appear strange to you, I like to dance in Crystal Glen. I was first inspired to do so many months ago when I first ventured here. The swaying movement before this simple altar, it seemed all at once as though my soul were soaring upward through vast skies of spirit. Oh, <laughs> my Lord, forgive me for bursting in like this. I'll leave you now. Please, say a prayer for all of us that the clans find lasting peace now that the war is over. Such is, in fact, the purpose of my prayer. Please, don't go. Your dancing may help me in my meditations. Pray in your way, then, while I seek help in mine.
this way. He's out of the forest, sir. Still, we thought it wise for Bolton and Robin to accompany him a distance further. Mary, Roger, I've just how had a wonderful inspiration. Have you, my lord? Does it concern the peace? It does, indeed. What, in your opinion, would the people say were I to propose continued cooperation among the clans? It's what the people want, sir. I'm afraid our rulers may think differently. I don't mean that any clan should renounce its own integrity. All I'd suggest, rather, is that they agree to cultivate an active spirit of fellowship, as among brothers and sisters of one family. The people will appreciate this concept, sir. I understand your meaning. It's the rulers that must concern us. Historically, what they've always sought is power, not the warm hand clasp of friendship. Is your lordship thinking of some sort of peace treaty? A peace treaty? Though documents have no more binding force than people's willingness to honor them, still, a peace treaty, perhaps my inspiration, should be spelled out formally. Yes. Friends, help me. We'll call a council of the allied rulers. Come, you can be my messengers. Right. Let us act at once. Ponder, aren't you coming? We have work to do. I think that never in my life have I beheld such beauty. Come on. Something. 
Can't your mind persuade your vision to be versatile? Hmm. Why must both your <laughs> eyes give you the same message? <laughs> and your ears. You could hear my words with one of them and listen to the music of my heart with the other. Restrain me with one hand and let the other hand loosen the leash. Scold me if you must, but then smile <laughs> to show that we're still friends. Here's what I suggest. You could say, Crystal, you really shouldn't be reading letters from strangers. But still, Crystal, if they write to you, can they be such complete strangers? <laughs> or, Crystal, you really must be careful with whom you converse. But after all, Crystal, it always behooves one to be polite. You are asking me to be equivocal. Multi-leveled, Fidella. <laughs> Not equivocal. Isn't reality in itself multi-level? A toy sword in the hands of a child isn't at all the same thing as a real sword in the hands of a soldier. And letter, uh -huh. even from a young man, it's only words. Ink stains, one might say, on a sheet of paper. It's how we react to what's scribbled there that matters. Ah. There you have it. It's how the mind evaluates what the eyes see that matters. It's clear to me you aren't of two minds at all. Oh, Fidella, I'm dying to read you this letter. Can't you forget just for a moment that you're my governess and be a woman, be a friend? Can't you see how important it is that we women stick together? Well, I must admit, I am dying to know what's written <laughs> Well, <clears throat> all right, dear. <clears throat> After all, there are some things only we women should know. Mm -hmm. The human race itself is of two minds, male and female. Sometimes it's better to our convenience if we don't let the men know what our minds are thinking. <laughs> Do read me the letter, and I will listen with one ear and keep the other, if not deaf, at least hard of hearing. <laughs> Mind you, the letter means nothing to me. Of course not, of course not. The young man's name is Mary. I have no idea who he is. Then, how do you know that he's young? Well, that is, I've caught glimpses of him here and there, but we've never spoken. I did once, though, catch him smiling at me, <laughs> but he's very shy. <laughs> Listen to what he writes. Dear Crystal, dear, how wonderfully he writes. <laughs> It's amazing to me that one so young could have conceived of such a word. I have seen you from time to time, but always, I'm sad to say, from afar. He's sad, poor boy. Oh, Fidella, it's wrong not to comfort people in their sadness. I find you an inspiration to look at, but till now I haven't dared come and speak to you. <laughs> an inspiration. He hasn't dared. <laughs> oh, Fidella, men are so quaint. <laughs> may we please meet sometime. You may answer me in care of someone we both know. His name is Ponder. There you have it, Fidella. He knows Ponder. We know Ponder. That makes Mary practically a friend of the family. Oh, bosom. Truly bosom. <laughs> <laughs> this letter isn't from a stranger at all. Yours truly, Mary. Yours truly? Why, he's practically plighted me his troth. <laughs> oh, Fidella, such depths of faithfulness in one so young must certainly be admired. My dear, I believe it's high time we return back down to the ground floor. I do not wish to scold, but I do believe you should exercise a little bit of Oh, I'll be cautious, all right. I don't want Father to find out. <laughs> He's very pretty for one so young. <laughs> Father! What are you two doing here? You should be at home. Don't you know the importance of this occasion? In a few minutes, the lords of the Allied clans will be meeting here in our ancient forum. It's a great honor for Clan Amethyst, but there's no place here today for women. Are you saying women deserve no honor, Father? 
On the contrary, woman is worthy of every honor when she remains at home caring for it with the devotion one would lavish on a temple. Temples are public places, therefore people are welcome in them, and there ends any resemblance to our home. The home in which you were raised is a shrine to the noblest principles. Bigotry, self-centeredness, <laughs> indifference. Lord Kobar will be here shortly. Leave quickly now before he arrives. I don't want him to think that I look upon this important occasion as a family outing. Will you be coming soon? Lord Kobar is my brother-in-law. I anticipate that he will want me by his side during the formalities. I expect, therefore, to be returning late. Sardok, do try not to tire yourself. <laughs> you will tend to take things so seriously. <laughs> well, obviously, if things are important, they are serious. Everything one does is or ought to be important. Everything, therefore, as far as I'm concerned, is serious. And only as far as you're concerned, which is to say, only as far as it concerns you. It's your very self-involvement, Fonda, that makes you so somber. Impertinent child, I'm self-concerned. Not self-involved. How can a person be lighthearted when the whole world is out to snatch from him all it can? Self-interest, I always say, is nothing but self-honesty. Caring for one's fellow man is a cowardly sham, an underhanded means of getting one's own way. <laughs> Cooperation, I always say, is nothing but compromise made by the weak-hearted. And if caring for myself makes me somber sometimes, <clears throat> um, well, a little somber, that's because it's no easy task fending off the self-serving demands that people make of one. Yes, and that's something else I always say. To those who are eager to study my philosophy, self-interest is good when it concerns one's own needs. By definition, it is bad when it concerns the needs of others. Kind sir. You don't know me. By what presumption do you call me kind? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not an occasion for sorrow. And I'd like to make it clear that kindness is completely foreign to any sound philosophy. Oh, I'm sure you're very kind, sir, really. If you weren't well-meaning, you wouldn't announce your failings so openly to others. Failings, you say? Failings? Yours, madam, is a failing. You failed to conceal from me the fact that you meant nothing whatever by calling me kind. All you wanted was slyly to wheedle out of me some information, which, as it happens, I see no reason for withholding. You're dressed in the colors of Clan Topaz. It's obvious why you're here. Yes, this is today's meeting place of the clans. Then this is your ancient forum? It is. And Lord Kobar will be here shortly to initiate the proceedings. It's a bit of a ruin, isn't it? It is a total ruin. Why mince words? There is no roof. The walls collapsed centuries ago. One must watch carefully where he walks, lest he sprain an ankle. But why? Why would Lord Kobar call such an important meeting in a place like this? Lord Kobar is my brother-in-law. Everything he does is reasonable. As it happens, all of his important councils are held here. Our ancient forum may be a ruin, but in it have been enacted the most vital laws in the long history of Clan Amethyst. The influence of tradition is so potent on this spot that we count on it to guide us in every cornerstone deliberation. The feeling is a bit oppressing. It doesn't seem to welcome our traditions. Is your Lord Kovar open to the cooperation that has been proposed? by our Lord Christar. If Lord Kovar, my brother-in-law, has the wisdom to be guided by me, he will recognize and accept that your Lord, able leader though he showed himself in war, with our assistance, of course, has thrown both caution and common sense to the four winds. I see. Well, we are here to see about his accommodations in the town. Perhaps we shall meet again. 
Good day to you, sir. What a dry wind. Cooperation, <laughs> vultures all! No one would talk such nonsense if he weren't nurturing ulterior motive. The others must be coming soon. I passed two of Kristar's people as I approached. Ah! Sardok, why are you here? My brother-in-law, on this important occasion, I knew you would want me by your side. What for? Why, why I'm known, I think, for a certain philosophic skill, a talent which might be helpful during today's deliberations? You philosophized your wife, my sister, into an early grave. It is not my pleasure that you so treat this conference. Return to your home. My lord, I predict disaster if- Go home! <laughs> well met, Lord Kovar. Lord Voltar. <laughs> Greetings and welcome. In all this wide, star witness world, there can be no greater fulfillment than the pleasure of sharing with you, Lord Kova, this historic occasion. The plan, I understand, is to contemplate some new type of peace treaty, one based on cooperation. <laughs> A curious concept. <laughs> Yet I hasten to add, one that I'm all for, with the very small proviso that prime attention be given to that which is one's own by right. Loftar. <laughs> Lord Loftar. At last we meet together. What an auspicious hour. Could anyone have hoped mere days ago that ours would be the victory and ours then the peace? Lord Kovar, it is a joy to see you. Lord Voltar, I am honored. <laughs> Lord Loftar, I called ahead to you as we arrived, but you didn't hear me. I heard. It seemed to me, however, that a separate entrance would be grander for Lord Kristar, the great convener of today's conference. Why? Are we not equals? Uh, there speaks our great commander-in-chief. Condescension comes naturally to one who is accustomed to being in command. Loftar, brother. Who would denigrate the altruistic motives of our noble Christar? Let us not begin this auspicious day with dark suspicion. Don't misunderstand me, please. I am aware that Lord Christar's victory is worthy of the highest respect, as a testimony to his outstanding cleverness. <laughs> it behooves us all to consider, however, that cleverness in the ruling of a clan is very different from that cleverness which is required to win a war. No doubt you are right. Though, speaking for myself, I prefer always to be led by truth. It has not been my way to rule by cleverness. <laughs> Hear me, my brothers. I know once you've heard that any doubts which may have troubled you these days will be laid to rest, you'll be wonderstruck as I was. When first this concept came to me, you'll recognize its beauty its simplicity, its promise of a golden age to come. My brother, shall we sit? It is the honor of Clan Amethyst that these uh, suggestions, may I call them, be presented in our hallowed form. What you'll hear, my brothers, are not suggestions merely, but a solution to problems that for centuries have plagued all our clans. Clan Emerald has always wished that its neighbors saw matters with clear vision as you propose. Our clans for centuries have fed on rivalry. Our very national anthems proudly boast a gory victory over unnamed enemies. Yet who were those enemies? Those very clans, four in number, whom destiny has brought to share with us this fair crystal island. Proudly we vaunted every clan, our own unique superiority. Our clan, Topaz, sings. None other sings so well. 
So what have our people done? They've declared all others to be less meritorious than they. Mm. Clan Emerald dances. None other can dance so well. Your patriots, Voltar, have therefore declared that yours outshines in virtue every other clan. My brothers, can we not look upon every clan as the bearer of some special offering to enrich the banquet of our shared existence here on Crystal Island? Wise words, magnificent. Your idea is very much like the one that I have always held. Namely, that Clan Emerald's skills are such that the other clans ought forever be grateful to us. <laughs> You've given us the image of a banquet. May we dare hope that this banquet of yours will be one at which the food has a certain substance and is not a mere feast of words. Obviously, Lord Kristar has thought deeply about these ideas he's submitting to us. Dear brother, do speak on. There is pleasure in the very whisper of philosophical concepts. <laughs> the more abstract, always, the better. <laughs> I have a treaty written, which I'll submit hereafter to your judgment. But to give my concept greater substance, let me compare a nation to what is nearest to each of us, our own homes. We expect and even demand that our neighbors respect our privacy. We also claim, each one of us, freedom to direct our own affairs, to balance our own accounts, to discipline our own children, and to decide for ourselves how we shall spend our leisure moments. In no home anywhere do anthems ring out in boastful challenge to one's neighbors, nor is it heard of for the residents of one part of any village to invade another, to seize its homes and annex its territories, living closely together as we do, known to one another, all of us rather do our best to live together in friendly peace and harmony. This then, brothers, is the essence of my plan, that we teach our people to view Crystal Island, beautiful it is, green and fertile, so bountifully able to sustain us all, as our village simply, that we who live here view one another lovingly too, regardless of the color of the clothes we wear. It's a marvelous notion. But to your treaty, is it presumptuous of me to hope that it will prove not only marvelous, but also workable? You spoke of that green island, green, surely, is nature's favorite color. But just as dance, is her true mode of self-expression. See how she vacillates the meadow grasses, agitates the trees, nods proudly in the flowers. The wind it is that moves them all. <laughs> and wind, like our clan, sings also, laughs playfully, speaks to us poetically in rhyme, and teaches wisdom by not identifying itself with anything it touches as it goes its way. <laughs> My brothers, all I ask is that you open your hearts to the realities of others. If what I say appeals to you, accept it not. I plead with you as mine, but as the herald of a long-awaited truth. My lords, reflect. Could he have won this war with the rusty armory of idle schemes? It was not he alone who won the war. Well, let none forget the contributions we all made, Clan Emerald especially. A plant may overlook that it owes its life to the earth in which it sprang. But you, Lord Christar, are no such prideful plant. Your motives, it is well known, are pure. In any case, the issue is not how you won the war, but how we should proceed to carve the mm. peace. Carve? What a perfect image when combined with that of a banquet. Had you thought, Kristar, how we should treat our enemy, Clan Azure, now that their offensive ambitions have been silenced? A vital question. For cooperation, too, must have a goal, the bonding agent of some reasonable purpose. I know our traditions, 
how they hold that war gives to the victor rights of spoil and mm -hmm. recompense, but look back through the twisting lanes of history. How every vanquished clan, brooding on its shame, merely bided its time. Then, when stability returned to it once again, when crops were plentiful and shops were crowded with rich merchandise, the strengthened indices of a healthy commerce inspired the courage to hazard a revenge. Once again, the blood of young men soaked our battlefields, fields which in peacetime had been fertile meadows, homes their every brick laid lovingly, collapsed in ruin like so many homes before them. Women and children, defenseless, died in agony. Isn't the message clear? History has proved that vengeance is an idiot satisfaction. Prosperity will be ours only if, instead of claiming damages, we extend the hand of friendship and cooperation to our enemies as well. Are you saying we should not claim what is ours by ancient right? This surely is no reasonable purpose. I shall be the first to renounce my own claims. Indeed, these claims were never ours by right. A cage constructed by the burden residents ought to be checked twice for hidden doors. <laughs> Lord Loftar, your famed wit is welcome. Check what I say. I beg you for hidden doors. Meanwhile, Permit me to summon from beneath that massive oak where I left them, Lord Antar, what? Lady Andala, his gracious wife. I've brought to you this day Clan Azure's recently appointed rulers. Please listen to their case. If, after hearing it, you are convinced that Clan Azure's attitude has changed, that most of their people never wanted war, but were coerced into it, drawn unsuspectingly into a hurtling current from which, after years, they found no escape. Perhaps then you'll be willing to listen to the unprecedented plan that I propose. My lord and lady, may I present to you your fellow rulers? You know their names, though not perhaps their faces. This then is Lord Kovar of Clan Amethyst. My lord, my lady. This, Lord Voltar of Clan Emerald. My lord, my lady. And here finally is Lord Loftar of Clan Ruby. Uh, my lord, my lady. At last. After centuries, our clans meet, drawn together by a dream of unity. I've told these men, our brothers, of your coming. Would you explain to them the circumstances under which you live these recent years, and what your will is for the future of Clan Azure? My lords, we are honored. Few there be who, distant from Stoller's rule, are aware of the weighty burden under which we groan. Lord Stolar was a monster, but you know that well. Those who spoke out against him suffered death. We too denounced him with righteous fire. Our case, however, was such. was such that Stoller never dared to execute us. We were too highly placed by birth and also in the public eye. Instead, he cast us into a reeking dungeon, there to live with marauding rats and murderers, with hunger, cold, and coarse indignity. After the war, we were discovered with other so-called traitors, released, then recognized, welcomed with shouts of joy and reinstated in our former roles. At last, with acclaim, our people made us their new rulers. Our plan now is to undo the countless harms that Stoller did. Emerging from our prison, we were horrified to learn that great numbers of our countrymen, though never cast into dark dungeons, suffered equally, many far worse than we. If there is a special hell, where rotting souls suffer more greatly than all the other damned, twisting in agony and shrieking mercy, which never shall soothe their parched and aching brows, may Stolar's wretched residue, like a sack of putrid grain, be flung <laughs> onto its red, reeking floors. <laughs> My 
dear wife, what an anathema. <laughs> if we ourselves hope for mercy, must not we too be merciful? Stoller's soul is not his tormented person. Within each man, however dark his deeds, dwells an unconscious angel. We must let God determine by what tortuous path Stoller must climb to achieve at last his own high destiny. Meanwhile, Andela, ours is a task to live in goodness and make amends for all that he did in evil's name, to destroy not men's bodies only, but their minds, their faith in life, in God, and in themselves. My dearest husband, forgive me, please, I beg you. Our dearest, our only son is dead, slain by Stolar's brutal thugs. Our suffering has been too great to be forgotten lightly. Yet in my heart, I know that forgiveness is the way to true freedom and to inner peace. Your attitude, Lord Antar, is beyond reproach. Yet Lady Andula's hatred is, I must admit, rather more after my own heart. <laughs> it gives me hope that in future, our two peoples may be friends. For <laughs> it makes you human. Sir. I'd rather be defined by my potential for improvement than by my weaknesses. The bitterness I feel is my shame. It is not my pride. Dear wife, your words touch me deeply. For happiness is possible only by giving of ourselves to others. We find true happiness when our sympathies expand, and when by giving, we forget ourselves. I pray that the future of our peoples <laughs> grow and flower in a soil of love. Wisdom dictates that for now we swim with the impetuous flow. I too am thinking of the risk when a wagon goes careening down a slope, of leaping from it to doubtful safety on the hasty, unwelcoming ground. Lord Krista, I would not have you think that I oppose anything to which we all agree. Mm -hmm. Tell us, Lord Krista, what is your plan for a lasting peace? I've spelled it out on paper, which I'll distribute later for your study. The strength of this plan, however, is more in the change of consciousness for which it calls. First, I would ask you to absorb its essence. For the important thing is that we agree in principle that our clans strive henceforth to live by the consciousness of peace and fellowship, and not merely by the letter of the written treaty. My plan, then, is that we embrace one another in a spirit of goodwill that we view our island home as we do our own villages with the same love, with the same sense of stewardship. Oh, I see. So your proposal, whatever our apprehensions until now, is after all quite simple. I'm sure it will prove acceptable. But, but don't you think... No! <laughs> no! <laughs> Why should we think at all? <laughs> Lord Christar has spelled it out for us in principle. Whatever it contains that seems impractical will no doubt find address in the formal peace treaty he's proposing. Meanwhile, I think we may state quite confidently that all of us endorse his plan in principle. Forgive me, but <coughs> wouldn't our endorsement in principle sound rather like a purveyor of wonder medicines beginning his presentation with the word frankly? I see neither expression as prejudicial. Human intercourse is but an empty husk were it not for affirmations, at least of goodwill. My friends, my dear friends, I repeat, I see no reason not to accept this plan in principle. Naturally, we must see it spelled out more exactly in the treaty that our Lord Christar has brought for us to study. Meanwhile, surely, the sentiments he's expressed are excellent. I'm thrilled to receive your support. Tomorrow, we'll meet again. Then we'll all sign the treaty that will bind our clans to peace. It fills me too with joy to see the solar seeds of war, a metamorphose, purged in the brilliant sunlight of pure intentions, to grow into a plant that bids fair to nurture our whole island and bring forth fruits of peace, prosperity, and joy to all the five clans as never in history before. We'll see. <laughs> the 
influence of this foolish glee was such as seemed wiser for the moment to submit. Yet, the centuries of their influence, too, and fixed tradition, contained like a vapor within these ancient columns, will surely chloroform this <laughs> presumption of excessive novelty. <laughs> Oh, waves can be mastered best by those who go with them. Rise when they rise, and ride with a rolling crest. <laughs> Gazella, daughter, I'm pleased to see you. What news is there? Have the clans agreed to discard the threadbare jacket of clannishness? Have they realized that their fulfillment lies in sharing, never in hoarding for themselves? I have not heard yet, Father. As you know, I live somewhat apart from crowds to give my mind the freedom to soar in God. To live apart from crowds and human events need not separate you from human needs. True love for God develops naturally into love for all his children. Father, it is just on this point that I've come to you for help. I love mankind with a love impersonal. What then if one out of all others returns my love with a more personal sentiment? Is it wrong for me to love not mankind only, but one man especially? True love for any one man develops naturally into love for all. And yet, in the comfort of one love, I fear, lest my soul's freedom become trapped in a cage. Oh, Father, my soul would embrace the stars. It would s fly in gay formations with the swallows, crying out to them in flight, my dear ones, we are sisters all. It would soar over snowy mountain ranges and call down, friends, you are my brothers. To the ocean surf, it would shout, let me break laughing with you onto sparkling sandy beaches. We are one. It would see God everywhere, thank God for everything, and whisper to him always, I am thine, thine alone, ever thine. Daughter, you are blessed. That love is highest which renounces all boundaries and looks with equal gaze on man and woman, young, old, rich, and poor, on saints and sinners, on animals, rocks, trees, all as children of our one common Father. Love is the path by which God has drawn me to become one with him. I want to express this love in the way most pleasing to him. Might it be possible to find in human love a, br a bridge to God's infinite love? I have seen love that was focused first on another human being, inspire the lover in time to broaden his sympathies to include everyone. Thus he learned that the separate part was but a small expression of the whole. The rose speaks to our hearts, not of itself alone, but of all flowers, of nature everywhere. Abstractions appear vague to many human minds until clarified by concrete example. The depths of love, however, are not plumbed in the ripples of merely human passion. Human love is self-expanding, only when it beholds the eyes that gestures the smiles of the beloved as windows only, beckoning outward toward infinity. Holy Father, his name is Ponder. Several times lately I've caught him watching me. The last time his eyes said that he loved me. You could love Ponder and yet not lose sight of your soul's higher purpose if you remembered to love him always. A good man, I know him well. Not for himself alone, but for the love of God. I will reflect on your words, Father. Thank you for taking the time to share with me the fruits of what I sense has been a hint of your life's experience as well. Forgive me, Father, for bursting in upon you like a summer squall. I come bearing good news. The peace is assured. <gasps> Lord Kovar and the rest have agreed that by cooperation alone can all this island prosper. Good news indeed. Then have they signed the peace treaty? Not yet, but they've agreed in principle. Tomorrow they meet again to discuss <laughs> Tomorrow they meet again to discuss in detail the specific terms the treaty spells out for them. I pray the job gets done. For too long now has peace been looked upon as a condition merely, where man for a time 
was no longer committed to killing his fellow man. During times of war, this type of peace is recalled nostalgically. People remember the flowering meadows, but forget the wet grass, the dust-raising winds, the mosquitoes that can rob an evening of its felicity. <laughs> they see quaint, flower-boxed villages, but forget the all-too-human villagers, each with his private peeves and bitterness, his selfish wants, his petty pride, his secret insincerity. Let us pray that what the lords have agreed to in principle, they'll affix their signatures to and commit themselves. Father, they can't pluck it now. Oh, it would be too cruel. All that the people want is kindness, cooperation, and yes, love. It's time our clans became good friends. Want? Want must be seasoned by the higher demands of commitment to principle. Emotions and events that are consequent on them are like waves. Cresting for a time, they soon crash into a foam of isolating bubbles. Even so, the desire for peace and events that proceed from that desire must soon lose force and disappear if today peace is sought merely because people want it and are tired of war. Indeed, Father, may we all act with faith that what we hope for is both right and true. On wings of prayer, then, let us send out blessings of faith and divine love to all. <clears throat> Father, I've come here for another reason. I'm expecting someone. I wanted you to bless especially. Call me you now, Father. I'm deeply grateful for your counsel. His name is Starlon. Until only days ago, his clan was that of our sworn enemy. But to him, for years now, I have pledged my love. I shall be pleased to meet him. Does he know this place? He passed here a few days ago. Ah, I see him coming now. Oriel, I received your message. Is it really true? Are our people indeed free now to move across all boundaries as they will? To befriend whom they like without fear of being labeled traitors? Will our love receive at last the sanction of both our clans? It is true, my love. At last we can live our lives with song and poetry, our sweet companions, each giving to each, and in the act both rising nightly on moon rays of constant happiness toward heaven, there to embrace the stars. I thank God I've survived to live this golden hour. Many times in battle, when it seemed our victory was assured, I confess I tried to expiate our clan's great sin, at least in part, by my own destruction. But fate willed otherwise. On one occasion, I recall, I even dropped my sword, inviting death. Just then, my adversary was attacked from another quarter and forced hastily to defend himself. Your life now can be of much greater expiation in service and in love. Love itself will be my expiation. So shall it be. And though we seek to clothe love in our own <laughs> fancied forms, yet love also, like the wind, is not fettered by any form. Listen. Love calls to us from the very mists of death. Death itself dies when pierced by love's sword. Love, it seems to me, stripped naked like the wind, can be clothed in new forms as by death. Father, before the war I lost my dearest parents, slain the tyrant's holocaust. Love, however, has been preserved for me, proving itself the victor after all. <laughs> my children, you both have my blessings. May your union be founded not on human sentiments alone, but on lasting principle. From our hearts we thank you, Father. Ah, Oriole, the minutes have seemed to hang like glowing lanterns from the waving trees, lighting a long forest trail towards this shining moment. Sweetest, I have a song written in the slowly fading twilight as, though wakeful, I sat dreaming of this long-awaited moment. May I sing it for you? Dearest, of <laughs> course. 
Meetings were made for singing, especially when two hearts are conjoined in love. Two souls were conceived at night, ere stars in the sky gave light, ere planets were born, ere hearts could know scorn. stars they strew, deep seas and vast plains, men's joys and men's pains, all these in perfection they knew. Their love called them down from the skies, to live here on earth in disguise. They see mortal love, yet remember downward from such lofty regions, yet surely they aspire to the same heights. I too have written you a poem, but let me speak first from my heart, as love suggests the words to my mind. I've no objection to poetry, I assure you. What girl doesn't want to hear her lover express his love for her in rhyme? But aren't rhymes too much an artifice? Love's like a bounding waterfall shunning embankments of any kind. What? Would you say that those bruises which the unpracticed bard inflicts on his poor groaning instrument have greater meaning than that evoked by fingers, trained through practice to express the subtle nuances of feeling? What are art's nuances, if not the dying embers of actual sentiment? How often the best poetry is written, not in the heat of passion, but long after the fire has cooled, its charred wood alone remaining to serve as a pencil for composition. Oh, but reflect, is not living to an art? Passion, when uncontrolled, prevents a man from living up to the highest that is in him. Art, without artistry, human feeling would remain merely vague and brutish, expressing itself in exasperated grunts. <laughs> art alone brings clarity to me. Well said, love. And art is born when inspiration can prolong its ardor, burning fiercely still, even though cooled by the snows of contemplation. Well, but first, love, let me give you words pulled from a blazing furnace. Later, I'll give you poetry. My sweet, as I was coming here, I heard a nightingale its liquid notes, like ripples on a flowing brook, in the stillness of cold moonlight, bore my heart's feelings before me to this place. A mariner I heard of once, who'd roamed the earth in search of happiness. His ship touched on distant coral coasts. It entered turquoise-colored seas and docked in tropic palm-encircled harbors. He crossed vast sandy deserts with the caravans, trudged over mountain passes in search of fabled hidden valleys. He sailed on mighty rivers through terraced fairy lands, through proud towered majestic cities, and past peaceful humble villages, where the country folk at sundown gather to sing, laugh, and tell stories, echoing some far off golden age. The mariner returned at last to Crystal Island, convinced after many years of roaming that all the happiness he'd ever sought was his, not for voyaging, but for ceasing to think of happiness as far away from him. How great then is my own good fortune that happiness has come to me unsought, that it sits here clothed in loveliness beside me and lies not in empty fancy on some distant shore. In you, my heart knows a completeness that, no matter where I go, goes with me, filling my thoughts with inspiration, even as a friendly wind fills the sails of a sea-braving vessel. 
This sense of fulfillment makes me feel that even on distant coasts, I'd always be at home. If this be not poetry, my love, then I marvel to think what exotic words, like birds of brilliant plumage that flit in bright streaks of light through a rainforest, you mean to import here to dim the beauty of your impromptu speech. The words I've written have merit, if any, not for their beauty, but for the fact that my sincerity while writing them burned ever fiercely as I struggled to enclose it in some proper form. Dearest, when I think of thee, heaven opens, and I see shafts of light upon the earth. All then seems of noble birth. Kindness then appears divine. Human error then benign. Goodness rules the universe. Men a higher love rehearse. Thoughts of you my peace assure. Calm my heart and make it pure. Even so, your actions screen all in life. 